Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. And beside me is Nick Thomas. He is the chief educator at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Nick, great to see you. Good to see you, Mark. Well, we're happy to have you. Nick has been appearing on our show uh, once a month or maybe more frequently when we've got some great space history that's a wheelhouse of, of his wonderful knowledge. And today we're going to talk about one of your favorite missions and mine, Gemini Titan Three. when... Yeah. Gus Grissom and John Young shook down this very important spaceship called the Gemini. Yeah, first manned test flight of the Gemini spacecraft, and really the forerunner of all the missions that brought together all the technological and uh, uh, engineering requirements that we had for Apollo. Rendezvous and docking, long duration space flight, and walking in space. So um, I'm sometimes perturbed with people who call Gemini a stopgap program because, like, we we're just marking time uh. or something. No, we were doing some very important engineering and developmental flight tests during that program, and Gemini three was the first step in those uh, in those accomplishments. And Nick, what was fun is you and I were teenagers on fire about space during those years, oh, and uh, every six weeks was a was a, a mm. launch of humans to space. And I talk about how would you find out the most accurate information going on? Folks, that had been your AM radio dial. Oh, well, where you had the news at top and bottom of the hour. And speak for yourself, John Alden. I was still in elementary school. Oh, you were still in elementary school? Okay. All right. I knew I may have said something wrong by the look on your face. Well, you just say well, yourself, I was in eighth that's grade. your problem. I was in eighth grade. So, uh, uh, but uh, yes, uh, well, we're going to enjoy a lot of beautiful images that you've never seen before. Nick has put together a great program. Wanted to brag about Nick. Yeah, Nick Thomas is the communicator for Delaware North at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. For more than 35 years, Nick has brought education, enlightenment, and his love for space to millions, just millions of people you've talked to, Nick, of the daily visitors out there at NASA's wonderful complex. Nick is a 2017 Harry Colcom News and Communications Award winner by the National Space Club of Florida Committee. And you joined the Visitors Complex in 1987. And behind the scenes, Nick is of all of the operations uh, of, of the uh, communications. And we call Nick the chief astronaut wrangler out there. And we go see our astronauts that he deals with every day, supervising their public talks, autograph sessions. And like I said, a lot of behind the scenes things there. So Nick, we're proud that you found American Space Museum and support Stay Curious this way. And, uh, and and I'm happy that I can call you my friend. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be a part of this uh, operation, which is really, I think, the cornerstone of the, uh, uh, if you will, the, um, the uh, space memorial business here in Titusville. I mean, you've got such a grand, uh, a uh, collection of artifacts here and some great stories to go with them. So it's a great pleasure to be a part of this operation. Well, we thank you. You're helping us get some astronauts eyes on our museum here and see some of these artifacts that we know they appreciate. We're going to have a, uh, let me go back this way, Shuttle Fest 2. People are calling about it. We're going to post the details about it tonight and tomorrow. It's a go for April 15th. And Nick is going to be our master of ceremonies and participate in our opening panel discussion. That's going to be, uh, the topic's gonna to be the 30 year legacy of the shuttle era. Nick's gonna be part of a panel with CNN uh, reporter, John Zarella and uh, shuttle photographer, Tom Usiak to kick off Shuttle Fest. And we got a lot going on uh to celebrate the base to space mobile launch platform documentary so you'll be hearing a lot about that nick i'm excited to have you part of what we're going to do every year honor the shuttle workers and the astronauts with this incredible era that i always say has changed our society like people don't understand yeah remarkable the advancements that program has made possible and so often we'll get young people who will ask you know what has the program done for me while they're dialing up their iphone or listening to their pods or whatever but the technology the incredible technology boost given to this country by the space program is uh is remarkable. And some people say, well, we would have had all that stuff sooner or later. I said, yeah, that's the thing. We would have had it later, much, much later, later than, yeah. we, than we did. 
people wouldn't be looking at their palms with that computer in it, maybe. like. But more today. importantly, you think of all the safety and rescue equipment that we've made possible in the program, uh, ways to keep people safe, ways mm -hmm. to save lives, not only in the way of uh, search and rescue, but also in your emergency room. So the 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 accomplishments and the spinoffs of the program go way beyond uh, 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 improved golf clubs and uh, ski bindings and so forth. We've done some important things. I think those are things that people should be uh, cognizant of. Very important. And there's another show for Nick Thomas to put together for us one day <laughs> as Nick and I are, Just are talking are, myself into more well, work, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, really. Well, I do that quite frequently because yeah. I, I love history just like you do. This yeah. guy knows so much. You're going to learn so much about this launch on our green screen on March 23rd, 1965. Mm -hmm. This kicked off what I still say is one of NASA's greatest eras. Like Nick says, that this this uh, two year period of 10 missions, we had to learn how to go to the moon and they did. Uh, but I love this lift off and I'm just going to push the button there and say, Nick, Take it away and tell us about Gus Grissom and John Young and well, GT3. Let's, let's start off with the mission emblem that we see here. This mission emblem, emblem actually came about after the flight. Uh, these patches were cut after the flight. And this design is actually designed after coins that the guys had struck that they took up with them into orbit and they gave them away to mm. friends and family afterwards. So this is actually based on the uh, coin design. The first time we saw this rendered in cloth on an astronaut's flight suit was John Young's back when, I think during Apollo 10. But Betty told me that Gus had a drawer full of these things back at home. Hmm. Yeah. Never seen them come up in any auctions or anything. Nick. No, no, because it's strictly speaking, it's not what you call an official flight patch because it didn't, it wasn't cut until after the flight mm -hmm. itself. But uh, still a beautiful design and really spoke well to the oh, it is. to the mission. And uh, you can tell Gus's hand was in that design very heavily. The Molly Brown yeah. going to tell us about there for sure. <laughs> yep. yep. That, uh, so we'll go forward yeah. there. Hit let's the talk there about anytime you want. Let's talk about the crew. This is our mission commander, Gus Grissom, who was born in Mitchell, Indiana. Uh, he was an air cadet at the time of World War II, but a combat veteran of the Korean War. He flew 100 combat missions during Korea and, in fact, asked to extend 25 more missions, but he was refused. He went on to attend Purdue University, uh, receiving a bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering. And then from there, he went to the Air Force Institute at wright Pat and uh, received a bachelor's degree in aeromechanics. He attended Edwards Air Force Base, a uh, test pilot school for the Air Force, and was assigned as a test pilot to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where he flew in the uh, fighter test division. Uh, he was selected by NASA as an astronaut in 1959. He flew on Mercury Redstone 4, Liberty Bell 7. He was a command pilot for Gemini 3 and was also assigned as a command pilot for Apollo 1. John Young was born in San Francisco, California. Uh, he spent his elementary and high school years in Orlando, Florida. He attended Georgia Tech, receiving a bachelor's degree in aero engineering, attended Pax River uh, Naval Test Pilot School, and also established two time-to-climb records in the F-4 Phantom. Uh, he had reached 9,800 feet in 35 seconds and then reached 82,000 feet in 227 seconds. Mm. He was selected by NASA as an astronaut in 1962. He was a pilot of Gemini 3, the command pilot for Gemini 10. He was a command module pilot for Apollo 10, the commander of Apollo 16, uh, where he walked on the moon, and then the commander of STS-1, the very first shuttle flight, and STS-9. So we've got a very distinguished crew on board for the first flight of the uh, Gemini spacecraft. This is the Gemini simulator over at our Mission Control Center here in Cape Canaveral. Now, Gemini 3 was the last flight to be controlled from Cape Canaveral. Uh, that chore was eventually turned over to Houston Mission Control for Gemini 4. But we had two of these simulators, one here in Florida and one in Houston, Texas. And this is uh, uh, Gus and John getting their uh, uh, shakedown or their first view of the uh, simulator. And in the next picture, I think we'll see them. Yeah, here we are, su suited up in those G4C pressure suits outside that same simulator here at the uh, 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 Cape Canaveral Mission Control Center. Now, there were a number of firsts that were performed on this flight, not the least of which happened to be the food that uh, was taken up there by the crew. Now, this was the advent of the freeze-dried food. And you see here you see some 
examples of that. On the left, you see the technician adding water to some uh, beef pot roast. To the mm -hmm. right is orange drink. I think we can pretty well assume that was mm -hmm. the notorious Tang. Uh, to the right, uh, you see the small wet wipe, and below that, uh, a bag of toasted uh, bread cubes, and then below that, uh, some uh, bacon and egg uh, bite-sized cubes. These cubes were coated in gelatin so they would not produce crumbs. Uh, but as Gus said later on, he wasn't interested in space food or sea urchins as much as he was interested in performing some real first with this uh, brand new spacecraft. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some extra extracurricular food items that were right. Some wipes. On that's broad. interesting. Yeah. Uh, back in '65, yep. you don't think about that's pioneering the wipes well, and the bacon squares were really popular though. Weren't one they? of the, one of the things too that came out of the program around that time. Uh, were the uh, self-sealing bags. You see with baggies, that uh -huh. tongue and groove uh, yeah. stealing arrangement. Uh, that was first done for uh, during the space program. And my father-in-law worked on the uh, launch pads, uh, pads 39A and B. He was one of the electricians out there. And he would bring some of these empty sealing bags home to his daughter, to my wife. And she would, she, they put her sandwiches in there, and she'd go to school, and she'd open up one of these fancy bags. It gets, where is that? Where did you get wow. that? I've never seen anything like yeah. that before. But uh, that was kind of part and parcel of being a uh, a child of the space program. That's, yeah, th little things like that you don't think about, like the first LED lights uh -huh. that someone yeah. saw timekeeping. Uh, they couldn't wait to tell their wife they saw time being kept in midair. Those on those one little, our, yeah. Yeah, in there. So yeah. uh, there's a pretty – and, and – Nick brings a lot of good rare pictures with us from the NASA library, and we appreciate that. Here's one you probably have never seen. Water egress training. I believe this might have been, um, I'm not sure where that tank was. It might have been just outside of Houston. I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But here you see the guys getting out uh, of the uh, capsule there in the water. And the protocol was you open up the commander's hatch, and both guys would, the commander would step out of that hatch. The pilot would have to crawl over the console and then step out of that hatch. But you see Gus on the left in the water and John just getting out of the vehicle. And, of course, this takes on significance when one remembers the fate of the Liberty Bell 7, which mm -hmm. uh, sank in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but this was part and parcel of the training. And uh, uh, all Gemini crews qualify for water egress training. Eventually, they even moved it out to the ocean, which was not a lot of fun. Mm. Uh, I remember Al Bean was part of one of those tests, and he and his he and the engineer had to stay in that capsule in those rolling seas in the Gulf of Mexico for like eight to twelve hours, I think it was. And it was mm. just a miserable way to spend your time because that practice capsule was hooked up to the retrieval ship by means of an electric cable, and they were testing the comm system on the spacecraft in the water. So that was just some of the miserable stuff you had to do as a rookie astronaut. You wake up in the morning, be an astronaut, and then you get wet or out at sea, like you said, for six hours or doing this, you know, uh, just amazing the, the, the rigors of physically what, that they were put through every day. One of the shuttle astronauts told me he knew his time was up when, um, when he was a rookie astronaut, they said, you want some simulator time? We got a block from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. Oh, yeah, I'll take it. And he'd <laughs> run over there with his feet on fire. He said one day they offered him the midnight to 3 slot on the simulators, and he said, no, pass. And he knew that's <laughs> when it was over for him as, a, as an astronaut. And his whole the, family the went. Thrill, the thrill well, was gone. Well, here's our guys. Yep. This is on a uh, uh, an RF frequency test tower. This tower is actually about four stories tall, and the guys are getting ready to get inside Molly Brown back there, and they're going to test all the uh, RF and electrical systems. And the reason you had it up so high was so no ground-based RF could interfere with the test. And uh, so this was a, a unique test for mm -hmm. the uh, Gemini spacecraft. And in the next picture, you'll see Gus in his bunny suit getting into the command pilot side, getting ready for this uh this test, which went went on for several hours, I understand. Wow, look, they are up there kind of yeah. high. <laughs> this is during one of the pad tests. This was an abort, uh, an egress abort exercise. Uh, the crew would have the M113 armored armored personnel carrier at the base of the uh, tower, and here you see the crew walking down for that uh, uh, exercise. There's Gus in the lead. He's followed by backup pilot. Uh, Tom Stafford, the general. and behind him are backup command pilot Wally Shira and John Young in his uh, 
pressure suit in the uh, in the back by the elevator. Well, Nick, you said something I didn't know. The MS-113 tank yeah. originated in the Mercury the M1, days. The M-113 was, the shuttle was carried out through the uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the uh, mm. shuttle program. It was a very reliable vehicle, and it was a very strong, powerful, and fast enough to get you out of Dodge when you had to get out of Dodge. We've, we've seen that a few times. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's Wally and uh, Gus in the uh, suit-up trailer over at Pad 16. This was stationed. A trailer. Uh, yeah, a trailer, trailer. Exactly. Not a building. Okay. And uh, this was the suit-up trailer, and uh, Wally and Gus going over some uh, some some notes here. Uh, this trailer, as I say, was used for the suit-up, and then they would get into a van and drive over to Launch Pad 19, where the vehicle was. Now, in the beginnings of Gemini 3, they had to take a long roundabout route to Pad 19 on a bumpy road, which was very uncomfortable. Gus complained about it one day. And at that time, there happened to be an Air Force sergeant out on the Cape named Gunnar Barton. And Gunnar was kind of a uh, in the mold of Sergeant Bilko. He was a <laughs> hustler, scam artist. Uh, if you needed something, you went to Gunnar, and when he delivered it, you didn't ask a lot of questions about how he got it. So Gunner, in 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 the broad strokes, he was able to commandeer some uh, 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 earth moving equipment and dump trucks and uh, uh, rollers to go out there and basically lay this road overnight, asphalt and everything. And when the crew went out the next morning, here they are on this nice, short, uh, very smooth highway, and. Nobody asked any questions about how it got there, but everybody pretty pretty much realized that Gunnar Barton had something to do with it. So <laughs> Gus had a sign made up, and he posted it at the beginning of the road, and he called it the Barton Freeway. And the word free was capitalized because it didn't cost anyone a single cent. <laughs> we found out years later that Gunnar had commandeered a road construction crew that was working at the nearby pad and got them to come over at night and lay and pave this road out for the guys. And that was the kind of thing you had going on back in those old days. Yeah, it was, and uh, yeah. strikes my memory here uh, that we're looking at uh, two very important commanders of maiden flights there. Yeah. Wally Sherrod wouldn't know that he would command the Apollo 7 maiden flight of Apollo. Mm -hmm. And then we got John Young, Commanded that yeah. important STS-1. Yeah, so, you so got that's three commanders here in our story. Here. Some of the real Mount Rushmore guys in the program. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Here we have uh, uh, John and Gus uh, walking away from the tower at Pad 19. That is the Erector Tower, and the Titan was uh, erected on the launch pad in two stages, the first stage and then the second stage. And that tower was kept there uh, until uh, probably about, 45 minutes before the launch, and it mm -hmm. was then slowly lowered down. We'll show you that in one of the other uh, photographs. This is uh, Gus and John in the operations and checkout building. It was recently completed. Uh, this was part of what was going to be the new Apollo complex, all the construction that we did from 63 through 67, which included the ONC building, the vehicle assembly building, launch pads, crawlers, transporters, and everything. And the uh, ONC building and crew quarters up on third floor were the first things to uh, come to life. And here we see uh, Gus and John on their way to the dining room for uh, for breakfast. They were yeah, awakened like that John it, saying, "Where's my coffee?" Yeah, they <laughs> were. Coffee. They were awakened that morning at 5 a.m. Wow. Now in the next picture, we see uh, the breakfast table, and there we have uh, Gus at the head of the table. Now, going on the left of the uh, table, from left to the right, on the far side, you see Alan Shepard. And Alan, at that time, was the chief of the astronaut office. And uh, to the right of Al is Walt Williams. Now, Walter was our program manager during Project Mercury. Walt Williams is one of the legendary guys of the flight test business. He was involved in the X-15 programs. Mm. Yeah, very smart, very capable, and yes, a very tough manager and engineer. Now, in the foreground, uh, turning his head to the right, is James McDonald. He's the head of McDonald uh, Corporation that uh, designed the Mercury and the Gemini spacecraft, known to the workers and everyone else as Mr. Mac. And he was a unique leader uh, in the space program. Uh, you wouldn't find him in his office. Nine times out of ten, he'd be down on the factory floor seeing how things were going. And there was a story back in those days, if, if you were a worker and you had some kind of problem on the assembly line, all you had to do was go to the cafeteria at 12 noon, meet up with Mr. Mac, who'd be in line, say, hey, I've got a problem. 
And Mr. Mack would say, get your lunch, I'll pay for it, and we'll go sit down and talk about it. And that's how he, that's how he managed. He, was, he led from the front, and he was a great inspiration. Uh, uh, he was a great favorite to the uh, astronauts in particular because of his uh, hands-on uh, uh, management style. Uh, he was tight with a dollar, as they say. A big, uh, uh, a big dinner or a big lunch for Mr. Mac for Mr. Mac was when you were invited to the conference room for box lunches. That was his idea of a big spread. Hmm. And then off to the right of uh, Mr. Mac, you've got Deke Slayton, who at that time was the director of flight crew operations. Big healthy breakfast there. Now, uh, the Mercury astronauts there, uh, Slayton and uh, Shepard, are both grounded for medical reasons. Yeah. But the Mercury guys kind of set a precedence for having a lot of fun and a lot of gotchas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was a very... here's, uh, here's one of the, the culprits of all that. <laughs> Wally Shira, who was the king of the gotcha. And here he is at the trailer over at Pad 16. And when the crew walked in, here's Wally in this battered, beaten up Mercury pressure suit. <laughs> and he solemnly announces... The backup crew is ready to take over in case you guys chicken out. <laughs> so uh, you've got, again, you've got guests on the left, and uh, between them, uh, <laughs> with a wry smile, is uh, Deke Slayton. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Wally for sure there. And I love Wally's book, okay? Yeah. Wally's book's one of the underrated uh, uh, one of the earliest astronaut tell-alls. And, uh... Now, in the last image, we mentioned Alan Shepard, and it's it's not widely known. I don't think it's widely known. It's probably among uh, our fellow geeks uh, known that Alan Shepard was the original commander of the first Gemini flight. He was going to make that flight with Tom Stafford. Mm-hmm. But in 1964, he had that terrible episode which uh, led to a diagnosis of Meniere syndrome, and he was grounded until 1968. That's right. And then walked on the moon yeah. three years later in mm-hmm. Apollo 14. Yeah. On there. There was good old Wally. We got a question, Marty? Qu- a comment? We well, have both, actually. And Loomis, you got that uh, green screen up. I'll give you the comment first from Tom Usiak. Green screen photo is a bit ironic. The photo shows launching from pad 19 and pad 34 in the background, where he, meaning uh, Grissom, Ooh. would lose his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yeah. question comes from Carlton Bailey. Above your head's the scaffold for 34, huh? Yeah. That says that is ironic. And a question from Carlton Bailey. Uh, is the Barton Freeway still there, or what's the closest road? There's very little of it left, but when you go over there on the access road, uh, a sign has been put up on the pad 19 side of the Barton Freeway. It was uh, commissioned and done uh, by his by uh, Gunnar Barton's daughter. And... Uh, I took a picture of it. I'll have to uh, email it sometime and show you. But the the sign commemorating the Barton Freeway is still there. Um, you can see where the, where the roadway was, but it's quite overgrown with grass and weeds and so forth. But you can still make out where it was and where it led to. Thank you, Tom Usiak and Carlton Bailey, two outstanding photographers that you know well. Yep. And uh, uh, from the shuttle era and beyond here. So. Well, let's see what else we got here about to get these guys off the the ground here. There we are in the Pad 16 trailer and uh, that suit technician, Joe Schmidt with Gus. Now, this is obviously from a training exercise because if you look at the clock, it's uh, like 940 and Gemini 3 launched at uh, just shortly after at 924. So and Gus and Gus would never be that late for anything. (laughs) Right. But uh, this is a practice session. But there you got a good rendition of that G4C uh, pressure suit. And Joe Schmidt, who was with us during the Mercury program and followed all the way into the uh, Apollo program. Share with us the G4 suit and Apollo 7 you were telling. I mean, Apollo 1. Yeah, Apollo 1. You look at the pictures of Apollo 1, and they're very clearly wearing G4C pressure suits, Gemini pressure suits. The only difference in those suits was on the helmet where you'll see a um, a uh, laminate protect uh, protecting assembly for that visor when you uh, uh, rolled it back up, it would be under that laminate and it would be protected from being scratched and so forth. Mm-hmm. But those were G4C suits that they were going to be wearing on Apollo 1. Since it was a Block 1 spacecraft, they had no need to perform an EVA. Uh, the uh, A7, A7L suits were still being uh, uh, produced, still being worked on by the uh, uh, Dave Clark, I think, uh, was the outfit that did the AL-7 suits. So, uh, uh, yeah, when you look at the pictures of the crew out at Pad 34, 10 days before the fire in that uh, photo op they had, yeah, those are G4C pressure suits the guys are wearing. 
Well, hope you're enjoying as much as I am this conversation with Nick Thomas. He's a regular uh, presenter on our Stay Curious video podcast. And today we're focusing on the Gemini Titan three. Three Roman numerals is what we use. And Gemini, by the way, is the way NASA said to pronounce the program like Jiminy Cricket. Yeah. <laughs> they said in the press release. <laughs> And uh, so uh, you're not too young that you don't know who Jiminy Cricket is. No, I can't remember who Jiminy Cricket is. Yeah, no problem <laughs> Of course there. you are. Here we are coming out of the uh, Pad 16 trailer. Um, that's uh, the uh, Paul Haney, the public affairs uh, uh, officer uh, holding the door open. John in the lead, Gus following him, going out to the uh, transfer van, which the guys called the bread truck because it did look like a uh, – uh, bread delivery truck mm -hmm. uh, on their way out for that short drive along the Barton Freeway to launch pad 19 where the vehicle was. And there's a there's big, a bread uh, truck back there. Pit. And uh, truck, yeah. here we can see the guys walking up the uh, ramp toward the elevator at the uh, pad 19. Now, I, I noticed something very unusual here. If you look closely at the picture, you see all the McDonald guys are on the left and all the NASA guys are on the right. Oh. I don't know why or how they self-segregated like that. Well, uh, the helmets, you they, can see. Yeah, McDonald yeah, helmet, yeah, green, and yeah. the, the white ones. Are the... But it's <laughs> almost, they're almost standing across that gulf, almost like the Hatfields and McCoys. Yeah, one right, thing. But right. uh, that wouldn't be fair because everybody respect, respected the McDonald guys. They got us the Mercury program. They would deliver the uh, Gemini <laughs> program. And... Uh, Built I just found Louis, it. St. Louis, Missouri. I just home. found it funny that these guys would separate themselves yeah, that way. They, would. they probably had a McDonald photographer over on the right and a NASA photographer over on the left to get their guys in the picture. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Marty, a question? A question from uh, Tom Celentano. Is the Pad 19 White Room and portion of the gantry still on display at the Space and Missile? Museum. Yeah, I visited. Public enter it. Yeah, I visited that white room about a month and a half ago, and it is still there. Very impressive structure. And to uh, at, at our visitor center. No, no, at the uh, Air Force Space Museum. Oh, okay. Over near uh, Alan Shepard's pad, and it's always um, um, it's always humbling to stand in the presence of uh, hardware like that and realize uh, not only the astronauts who walk through those uh, through those uh, 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 structures, but also the engineers and the designers and all the uh, workers who worked on the Gemini program who spent time inside that white room whose names we'll never know but still are a very very important mm -hmm. part of this history absolutely yeah. absolutely you at the Kennedy visitors complex can walk across the catwalk to the apollo uh, spacecraft in uh, uh, two places one at yeah. the visitors complex uh gift shop mm -hmm. where we do the mm -hmm. you do the autographs and then the other one is over at the, the Apollo, uh, 1 Memorial, Apollo 1 Memorial. At Apollo Saturn 5, right. And, and I always think crossing those, just, just what a wonderful piece of history. Yeah, it's um, it's very humbling, like I say, to walk along those uh, gantry ways and to stop and think of the people who walk there ahead of you and the history that they made. Yeah, it's beautiful how they did that at the gift shop. Yeah. They, they spanned the second yeah. floor with this red uh walkway a lot of and though there, no, there's a plaque there i'm constantly telling people hey this is what apollo 11 astronauts walked you're across walking you're walking in the across footsteps of some very great people in history. absolutely well we're gonna get these guys in their spaceship mm -hmm. gt3 molly brown yeah spacecraft ingress took place at 07 30 that morning and a hatch closure followed shortly thereafter here we see gus on the left and john on the right and they've been strapped in and preparing to go over the uh uh, systems tests and checkouts with the uh, uh, ground control guys, uh, the, the communicator in the blockhouse, who they referred to as Stoney. And um, uh, basically, one last check of the uh, spacecraft and launch vehicle systems uh, before launch. And there's our command pilot in the left seat, Gus Grissom. Basically, at the apex, I think, of his professional test pilot career, here he is commanding the very first manned flight of a brand new space vehicle. And if you go to YouTube and listen to the Gemini 3 uh, communications there, and the whole mission is there, you can just hear the, um, I think, the excitement and the joy in his voice as he's working these different systems, talking about his vehicle. And he's just where a, a test pilot should be, in the uh, left seat, of a brand new vehicle on its first flight. And as I say, this was this had to be the apex 
of, uh, of his career. And coming off this mission, he was definitely at the top of the pyramid. He served one backup stint after this mission. He was a backup commander for Gemini 6. And then after that flight was completed, Deke Slayton cranked him immediately into the Apollo program, and he began, began working on that. Nick, uh, Gus had a lot it, uh, of input into the design of this cockpit. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. this is it was. They called it the Gus Mobile. Yeah, they seconded him to the uh, McDonnell plant in 1963 as Mercury program was coming to a close, and Gus was deeply and intimately involved in all the design des design decisions for that spacecraft, particularly in the cockpit. And the first four Gemini spacecraft were modeled after his frame. And Tom Safford complained about that because every time he got in the vehicle and tried to close the hatch, it hit him on the head. <laughs> so, yeah, they indeed uh, uh, began calling it the Gus Mobile. I think it's a very uh, apt uh, uh, name for it. And, again, I think that's one of the great legacies that Gus leaves behind, the successful and efficient design of a vehicle which made so much possible for the Apollo program. This was the sports car of spacecraft <laughs> yeah. eras, no yeah, doubt yeah. about it. It's uh, funny not, because they never built like it again, and I wish they would. You talked to, to uh, Mike Collins. In his book, he said that flying the Gemini spacecraft was like driving a little sports car. He said flying the Apollo spacecraft was like trying to steer the Queen Mary with an outboard motor. <laughs> oh, I never heard that. And he would be the man to know, yeah. the great Michael Collins. John Young, our pilot in the right-hand seat, uh, who would go on to make so much history, uh, mm -hmm. uh, walking on the moon on Apollo 16, uh, the first manned orbital uh, flight test of the Apollo combined Apollo spacecraft in lunar orbit for Apollo 10. Uh, of course, STS-1, the first time ever the brand new spacecraft flew for its first time with people on board. And that still puts John Young and Bob Crippen at the top of the pyramid mm -hmm. as far as flight tests is concerned. There's nobody who's going to surpass these guys, I think, for centuries to come. That SCS-1 flight, you just can't uh, you, you just can't give justice to the importance of it, the daring of it, and the boldness mm -hmm. of it. And John Young was a very important part of that. There were people who were saying that, you know, maybe STS-1 should fly unmanned. And John said, you fly this vehicle unmanned, and in three years, you won't have an astronaut corps. Hmm. And there was another engineer somewhere along the line who strongly recommended that the guys fly a test of the return to launch site abort program uh, on STS-1. <laughs> and John said, no, we're not going to do that. You're not going to put me into an emergency situation to see if I can get out of an emergency situation. That was some bad advice there. Yeah. But yeah, John Young, we'll talk a little more about him. We're just uh, uh, people in a press corps, he had six missions, and they'll say, well, which one of your six launches are your favorite? And John Young will say, he used to say, wait a minute, the seventh launch. Mm -hmm. And these ignorant people in the press go, seven? Yeah, getting off the moon yeah. on Apollo 16. That, that was, was no small That was the, the one that was most important to me. You You've heard him say that, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Here we have the launch of Gemini 3 uh, from launch pad 19. And as I say, uh, liftoff was at 9.24 a.m. local time. And you can see that very distinctive orange cloud in the background because mm -hmm. Titan II, being an intercontinental ballistic missile, used storable propellants, hot and myelomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. And uh, those were very bad, very <laughs> atrocious chemicals. The good news was that once they came into contact with one another, you had engine ignition. You didn't need some complicated ignition uh, source and that sort of thing. The bad problem was with these uh, propellants, if they got loose, they could dry clean your lungs. Mm -hmm. That stuff could kill you if it, if it got on your skin. It was very, very deadly stuff. It was not to be taken lightly. Uh, before the show, Marty and I were talking about that plume, that very distinctive plume with the uh, dark orange, light orange clouds, and also the white cloud in the foreground to the right. And my only guess there can be that we had some a water deluge system at the base of the exhaust channel at pad 19, and that would have caused that steam. But that pure white smoke tells me steam. Beautiful hypergolic fuels there. Yeah. And uh, I believe the only Titan II missile uh, 
is that this uh, in one piece is at the Stafford Air and Space Museum? Well, we have Bradford, one at the, Oklahoma. We have one at our you have one at one our little there. shop. Yeah, you and in did. fact, when we got that from the uh, uh, from the Boneyard, uh, Environmental and Safety held that rocket for two years, examining it to make sure that there was not a single trace of hypergol in any of the valves, okay. pre valves, the fuel lines, or anywhere. They had to make sure there was none of that before they turned it over to us. And out at the Rocket Garden, some birds have taken a nest on top yeah, of the Gemini Yeah, which is not capsule. unusual. That happened with our uh, earlier Titan rocket that we had there. <laughs> and the reason they picked the Titan is uh, that's the only one out there with a smooth, flat top. Yeah, you're All right. the others yeah. are rounded, they're beveled, they have a launch escape tower on top of them. But Gemini just makes a natural home for a nest. And you know those nests are just as strong as welded steel. They clamp down on something and they are not moving. And I think the last one uh, that we saw was only lost to hurricane winds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, uh, that's always interesting things out there at the Kennedy Visitors Complex. Yeah. Please go out there and and, and see the sights. There's a beautiful There's another beautiful picture. view uh, of the rocket taking off. Uh, the vehicle clearing the tower and the first words out of Gus's mouth was, uh, Roger, clock has started. And uh, and they like this rocket, those that, yeah. that, that rode the, the uh, yeah. Saturn V and S-1B. And later on during the ascent, uh, Gordon Cooper said, uh, yeah, Roger the pitch, you're on your way, Molly Brown. And Gus says, yeah, man. Now, you don't hear communications like that in the space program anymore. It's all very tightly regimented and scripted, yeah, but you don't, that, but yeah. if you, if you listen to the um, mission on YouTube, you can, you can hear some great, great expressions uh, by the, uh, uh, the flight crew, particularly Gus when he did talk because he was not a big talker. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, Chris Kraft told Gordon Cooper, he said, uh, you want to see if you can get him to say anything over this pass? Ask him to describe the United States or something. They were just, the news people were desperate to get something from the spacecraft that they could report on. So uh, when they came into uh, to, to, uh, a signal, uh, Gordo asked Gus about some of the problems they were having with the yaw thruster. And then Gordo kind of snuck up on the opportunity. He said, how's the weather look in general around the United States? And Gus wasn't having any of that. He just came back and he said, very cloudy. We've seen very little land. And that was <laughs> the end of that, dis that, that discussion. Huh. And John was more of an oh shucks guy though too though, but uh, he's, John, he's going to let his commander. Do John's going to let, gonna yeah. take the lead. Let the commander yeah, take exactly. the lead, and, yeah, he, and that's the way it's done. Yeah, in there. But there is uh, unfortunately the three orbits of Earth. Yeah. There was a lot of cloud cover this, over Earth. Uh, this would have been a view of Madagascar, but as I say, the uh, Earth weather that day was very cloudy. I think the only spot that they really got a good picture of was uh, later on. We'll see a picture of the Sonora Desert, but. Um, this was a picture, uh, I believe John was handling the camera throughout the uh, the mission. Gus was busy with the controls and the spacecraft systems. So below those clouds would be uh, Madagascar. Mm -hmm. Well, Nick Thomas, we're enjoying this conversation. And a lot of people associate Gemini 3 with uh, something that happened literally in a period of about 45 seconds. Yeah, this is... Got, th uh, John Young reached in his suit mm -hmm. and pulled out... A corned beef sandwich. Now let's 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 get to the bottom of the story. This idea was had by Wally Shara, and Wally had gone to Wolfie's Delicatessen over in Cocoa Beach and had this sandwich made up because he knew how dis, uh, distasteful Gus felt about having to test food and space and all the rest of this jazz. He wasn't interested in that at all. So Wally had the idea of having this corned beef with mustard made on rye and smuggled up in John's pocket. Now I believe he gave that sandwich to John. Uh, when they were in the Pad 19 trailer, and Gus didn't know anything about it. And John didn't know anything about it until Wally presented him with a sandwich. So this was definitely Wally's idea. So they got up on orbit, and sometime during the first or second orbit, I think it might have been the second orbit when John was testing the food, John suddenly said to Gus, he said, you, uh, you want to take a bite of a corned beef sandwich? And Gus turned around, and here's his corned beef sandwich. And Gus took a couple of bites. Well, crumbs started to float through the cabin. So they wrapped the sandwich up and they put it away. And then later on on the ground, when they're doing the post-flight inspections, the engineers found a lot of rye bread crumbs inside the capsule. Uh -oh. So during the debrief, they started asking the guys, and we didn't find a lot of bread crumbs in the capsule. You know anything about that? And guys said, no, we didn't know anything about that. We don't know. <laughs> so finally, the story came out. And uh, 
I can't remember, I think it was Life Magazine who picked it up and, and ran with it at first. And the public was absolutely enchanted with it because it, saw, it showed the human side of manned spaceflight. The politicians, regretfully, were not so enamored of this stunt. Not in fact, bit. some people in Congress went so far as to say that Shara and Grissom should be court-martialed because they didn't take the space program seriously enough. And, of course, we all know how politicians take life so seriously. Right, exactly. So, yeah, Bob Mueller was pulled, uh, NASA uh, VIP was pulled in front of uh, Congress. in front of Congress, and Dr. It. Miller was, was um, yeah. questioned about that. And do you guys really have control over your astronauts? And what's going on there in Houston and this, that, and the other? And he was... Um, uh, he was living at the foot of the cross uh, for yeah. that for that session, but um, later on it, it it came out that some of the astronauts were not too pleased with Wally because they felt that Wally came up with this joke and the stunt uh, and kind of contra contravened the the greater good of the program. And then uh, uh, a lot of people felt one way or another about it, but so it was. It happened, and there it is. But as it, I like as I like to say. I remember this flight for the maneuvers that were performed, not for the food that was smuggled up. Absolutely. And uh, I was trying to find my notes real quick that uh, uh, the infancy of space travel, we can't emphasize enough in 1965 that that uh, the danger and the aura around our super uh, space heroes as, as astronauts. Yeah. And, and then for, for this to come out is kind of a, a petty thing that they that they, they uh, uh, focused on, I think. Yeah, you got to understand that test pilots and fighter pilots are going to have a pretty edgy sense of humor. And if you can't get with that, stay away from that. Exactly my, <laughs> what my point was there, Nick. Thanks for picking up on that. Absolutely. The public didn't understand the danger and how these guys lived their lives. Mm -hmm. and this was just something to break up it's a like, very tense moment. It's where... like the old saying, they lived hard and they played hard That's and they right. were entitled to every moment of that play that they had. Marty, you have a question from our Stay Curious uh, watchers enjoying today's show with Mr. Nick Thomas. We have a comment from Tom Usiak. The new story on the sandwich was written by former NASA PAO Dick Young when he was with the Orlando Sentinel. Oh, yeah, Dick Young. I remember Dick when he was working at Press Site here at KSC. Yeah. yeah. yeah he was Dick. one of the first people I met out there. He was okay. a grand guy. Yeah, very famous. And one of the old, one of the old school guys. Too. The old school yeah. journalism, you know. You yep. know, I love that, Nick. Well, the guys got up there. That was literally less than a sixty-second incident, right up there. Yeah. The and 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 it became like national headlines and whatever yeah. astronauts are doing. And, well, let's get back to the and, real story. Yeah, let's get back to the real stories, right there. Now here are. we are. Uh, this is one of the clear pictures that they got uh, on board Gemini Three, and the majority of this picture you see in the center and toward the bottom is the Sonora Desert. And if you look toward the right, you can just make out the Colorado River. Um, so this was about the only, one of the only clear pictures that they got of the Earth during that uh, three orbit flight of Gemini 3. But again, the clarity of that picture and the, uh, the sharpness of it, and uh, it gave everybody a, a clear understanding as to what we could accomplish in space photography. We didn't have uh, the technology that we have today, but we certainly realized that we were going to uh, make some great headway in Earth observations uh, once we got that technology. Now, this is a good time to talk about the maneuvers that were performed on this flight that were very that were really the backbone of this mission, the major mission objectives. There were three maneuvers that were performed on Gemini 3, three different engine firings or burns. The first one took place over Corpus Christi, Texas, and that burn lasted for a minute and 14 seconds. And that burn uh, resulted in a change of velocity or delta V of 51 feet per second. Now, what that burn did was to change their orbit from 87 by 121 nautical miles to 85 by 91, almost circular. So we found out there that we could change the spacecraft orbit from on board. And this is something that has simply never been done before by any Russian cosmonaut or any American astronaut in... Um, Mercury, we only had the ability to maneuver uh, in the roll, yaw, and pitch axis. But here, with these new uh, OAMS thrusters, Ohm thrusters, orbital attitude maneuvering system, those thrusters would allow us to translate fore and aft along the x-axis uh, from side to side on the y-axis, 
and then up and down on the uh, z-axis. So these burns, these maneuvers were the key to rendezvous and docking, and rendezvous and docking was key to getting men on the moon before the end of the decade. So these were the three uh, uh, important uh, critical burns that were that had taken place. The second burn during the second orbit changed the inclination of the orbit by about 0 0.2 degrees, not very much. It was a lateral burn along the uh, uh, y-axis, but that was just enough to prove that we could do that. The last burn uh, lowered the perigee to 39 miles. So that meant that we would re-enter whether the retro uh, rockets fired or not. So these three burns, again, were the hallmark of the Gemini program and the key to rendezvous and docking, which was the key to landing on the moon. And this was the the thrill for Gus Grissom. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This was uh, the top of the pyramid for a developmental uh, flight test uh, pilot. And... Uh, this was something that he had worked for, that he had helped to plan, and uh, uh, he he wasn't worried about getting a ticker tape parade from a, for any uh, spacewalk or anything like that. But this simple but critical maneuver is what really puts Gus in the history books. And uh, uh, like I said, it paved the way for these rendezvous and dockings that were so important to the Gemini program to show what they were doing. Uh, living in space for seven days was another mm -hmm. goal because of three days of the moon, three days back, one day orbiting the moon. They did a 14-day yeah. mission with right. with a uh, 95-year-old now, uh, Frank Borman, Frank Borman mm -hmm. and uh, Jim Lovell. soon behind him, Jim Lovell will be 95, I think, next month, week. Uh, and then uh, the spacesuits was the third thing, mm -hmm. was, was yeah. uh, developing a spacesuit for the environment there. Uh the next, uh, this was the last mission to be controlled from Kennedy Space Center, our, correct? Our, our old Mission Control Center here at Kennedy Space Center. Which so we're been, looking at Houston here, yeah, right? Back in the old days, Mission Control on Cape Canaveral was MCC, Mercury Control Center. And then it was, la it was uh, its last mission was Gemini 3. For Gemini 3, Houston that you see right here was basically a monitoring station. And our Capcom on that station was Roger Chaffee. So uh, Houston, uh, Houston Mission Control was just basically being shaken down and tested uh, in the back on that last console, uh, leaning against the console is uh, Deke Slayton. So this was the uh, uh, first shakedown for Mission Control, and uh, Houston would take over the uh, uh, job of Mission, con uh, mission Operation Control for Gemini 4. Okay. There we go. Also in mission control in Houston that day were the astronauts' wives. That's Barbara Young on the right and Betty Grissom on the left there in the uh, uh, viewing room uh, behind the consoles uh, there in Houston. So they were able to monitor the mission uh, throughout uh, uh, right there in the uh, VIP viewing room. And meanwhile, back here at uh, Flora at Cape Canaveral, here we see uh, uh, AA, I think it was AA for space flight, uh, Dr. Robert Siemens on the left. Uh, next to him is Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who, as Vice President, was Chairman of the National Space Council. Uh, to the right is Dr. Kurt Debus, who is our Center Director here. And to the right of him is uh, Dr. Bob Gilruth, who oversaw the uh, manned space program, starting with Project Mercury and went all the way through Apollo. Gilruth was one of those uh, people whose contributions were absolutely indispensable to the space program, but at the same time, he was a guy who did not like a lot of falderall and publicity. He did not like, you know, speaking at events and things of that nature. He preferred to stay in the background, do his job quietly and diligently. And I will tell you, you don't find those qualities among bureaucrats these days. No, you don't. He's one of the top ones. So many people like that, really, yeah. in, in the space program. And that's part of what I'm enjoying mm -hmm. as I learn more space history here at the museum is learning about the impact uh, that uh, people like Gilworth had on, on the entire space. He was over the astronaut selection processes mm -hmm. and other things involved. Well, he was a man who uh, at Hangar S uh, that day in 1960 had told the original seven that Alan Shepard would be the first man to fly in space. And Shepard, in looking back, Shepard was asked what was the most pivotal event in his life. And he said it wasn't landing on the moon. It wasn't even being the first American to fly in space. The most pivotal moment of his life was when Bob Gilruth said he was going to be the first American to fly in space. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Uh, looking out the window. Another cloudy view. Uh, 
Uh, they were over the Pacific at one point, and Gordon Cooper said, ah, it's all clouds and water, isn't it? And Gus said, yep, there ain't much water either. <laughs> so as I say, uh, Earth weather-wise, it was a very, very cloudy day. You didn't have a lot of uh, good opportunities for Earth observations. But uh, <clears throat> as I said, we realized uh, once up on this two-man Gemini platform that we were going to be learning a whole lot about the Earth in the years to come. They took, I believe, a Nichromat camera, something like that, up with them, mm -hmm. a couple rolls of film. Never really saw a shot of them, and I don't think they took pictures no, of them no, inside there. No, no, and they wouldn't have been the ones to be taking Absolutely tour shots not. in the first place. Absolutely yeah. not. Uh, okay. Well, we get them back, and uh, this is a good way to uh, go this way. And uh, Yeah, after three uh, orbits. Uh, talk about the Molly Brown name yeah. that uh, Gus gave you. Well, of course, uh, there was a lot of... A lot of implied and not so implied criticism of Gus after the Liberty Bell 7 uh, sank to the bottom of the ocean. And um, Gus decided to go ahead and kid these folks right back. And he had the idea of giving his spacecraft a very unique name. Now, at the time on Broadway, there was a very successful Broadway show called The Unsinkable Molly Brown about the Titanic. So Gus kind of latched onto that and thought that would make a good name for his spacecraft. And you can remember that during the Mercury program, the astronauts were able to name their spacecraft. So Gus went to NASA and said, yeah, he's, I want to name the spacecraft Molly Brown. And the officials in Washington, D.C. kind of gritted their teeth and said, well, that doesn't sound too dignified. What's your second choice? And Gus said, how about Titanic? <laughs> so Molly Brown it was. And uh, indeed, as Gus said, she proved to be unsinkable, our beautiful Molly Brown. And here you see her on the ocean as the recovery uh, forces are approaching, getting ready to recover the spacecraft. Um, they did have one problem during the reentry. Uh, they realized that they were going to be off target. Now, the Gemini spacecraft had an offset center of gravity, which meant that during reentry, you could roll the vehicle in one direction or another. And you could, you could adjust either the lift or the downrange distance of the vehicle or the cross range from side to side. Well, the wind tunnel test gave this capsule more credit than she was really due as far as these changes were concerned. Gus did try to uh, roll out that um, predicted uh, uh, drift of, I think, uh, 37 miles, and he was unable to correct it. And as a matter of fact, they did land about 45 miles short of the recovery carrier. But again, this is why you do developmental flight tests, to find these problems, to identify them, and to correct them. So uh, that's the job of, uh, of a test pilot, and that's one of the things they were able to accomplish on Molly Brown. And they did get that uh, computer modeling and that uh, lift and uh, cross-range uh, business corrected so well that on Gemini 9, Tom Stafford manually piloted his Gemini spacecraft to a landing closer to the aircraft carrier than any mission in Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo. I think so, they were worried it was going to hit the ship at one point. <laughs> they, thought, they thought it was going to land on the number two yeah, elevator. Right. <laughs> but uh, uh, they did uh, successfully overcome that problem for Tom to exploit it to its maximum. And here we see the uh, spacecraft in the water. The uh, divers have attached the... Uh, pretty choppy uh, seas. Oh, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty good seas. Um, both guys did. Um, I know Gus. Gus had some uh, seasickness issues. I don't know if John did or not, but uh, it was so hot in that spacecraft they doffed their pressure suits, and you can see John there in the uh, life raft, and he's in his skivvies. Oh yeah, right so there they, in the center. Yeah. They hoisted the guys on board the recovery helicopter, gave them a couple of blue navy medical robes to put on, and when they got down on the carrier deck and walked across the deck in those robes they looked like a couple of guys who'd spent too much time at a shriners convention on uh uh in new york or something like that the, yeah. here's a recovery at the capsule and this was a few hours after the crew was, again uh, brand crew new was brand new they yeah. would do this nine more times in the gemini but doing it the first time is always fraught with yeah. with uh, engineering uh uh, changes and last not a, minute things and not a little bit of danger don't forget those rcf th uh, thrusters also oh, ran on uh, on uh, hypergolic fuels yeah. so uh you had to be sure that, that vehicle was safe before you even got it near the uh, uh hangar deck and here are the guys after the mission they're down uh, in the uh, medical bay speaking to the president of the united states lyndon b johnson and um 
uh, I think uh, Gus's part of the conversation was just merely answering yes, uh huh, thank you, sir, yes, sir. And uh, uh, I think John said the only problem he had with the flight was that it wasn't long enough. And Lyndon Johnson, in basic politician style, said, well, we'll see if we can do something about that in the days ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, fine. But that last picture of Gus, I think, is uh, <laughs> prototypical Gus. He's just come off the best day of his life, and the, uh, speaking to the president of the United States yeah. was, not, was not his biggest thrill that day. But um, uh, he's not unduly nonchalant about it, but I think he's got a lot more perspective on this event than many of us would have. But uh, he's just come off the best day of his life flying a brand new vehicle for the first time, and... Uh, his star was definitely in the ascendant. Uh, after that mission, he was well on top of the pyramid. And of course, his success on that flight led to his being named as the command pilot of the first manned Apollo flight, Apollo 1. And Deke Slayton makes no bones about it. And uh, his son, Scott, even told me that mm -hmm. dad was going to be get to be the first chance to land on the moon. You can see that in Deke's book. He said, if Gus had lived, he'd have probably been the first man on the moon. Yeah. And probably chosen Ed White to go with them, and who knows who else, but his, he was going to choose his own team there. So uh, Here they are after having been scrubbed up and cleaned up and getting those fresh uh, flight suits and able to uh, visit the Molly Brown one last time on the, uh, the hangar deck on the Intrepid. And uh, just give her a pat on the nose and thank her for being such a good spacecraft, which she really, really was. And that spacecraft, by the way, is at Mill Spring Park in Indiana, ah. just about two miles away from Mitchell, Indiana, where Gus was born and where he grew up. Southern Indiana down there, yeah. uh, French Lick, where great basketball player Larry Bird grew up. Uh, and they have a statue to him. It's right near there, too. I've not been there, and that's on my bucket list. Yeah, definitely. Uh, been to a lot of cool places, and that's one that they... They uh, usually have a, a, a summer event there too. We'll yeah, to I've visited. I visited Liberty Bell Seven, and I'd like to visit Molly Brown. Yeah, there you go. Here Liberty they are Bell. at the uh, skid strip. Liberty Bell Seven is in the Cosmosphere now. Right. By the way, where did you see it? When it was brought here on tour, two oh, okay. tours that she did here. Now this is the crew at the skid strip over on Cape Canaveral. They landed in that plane that you see behind them. It carried them from the Intrepid, and there you see uh, Gus with John behind him, and Gus. Uh, doing something he was not particularly fond of, which is, quote, saying a few words. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. uh, in the picture, too, uh, to the left, the fellow with the glasses, the tall fellow with the glasses, again, is Above our, your head. Uh, AA for space flight, uh, Bob Siemens. And I think to the far left, yeah. just under the tail of the vehicle, that might be Gus's father, Gus Dennis. We'll see a clearer picture yeah. of him next. Right. Gus, only about five foot six, one of the shortest of the astronauts. Well, here's a perfect end to a perfect mission. Uh, being congratulated and welcomed by your folks is Cecile Grissom on the left and uh, uh, his father uh, on the right. And his father, by the way, worked for the uh, uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. He did. Yeah, so he was an old railroad man. In fact, when they were thinking of names for Gemini 3, one of the first names that John and Gus looked at was Wapasha, which is an Indian tribe. And he thought that sound, sounded good. It would sound good on the radio. But then Gus had thought about it, and he said, no, if we call it that, people are going to start calling it the Wabash Cannonball. And what would my dad say when he was working on the Baltimore and Ohio? But, uh, yeah, Cecile and Dennis Grissom right there with Gus at the end of his, uh, of his flight. Well, we've come to... The end here of our nice program with Mr. Nick Thomas out there. Again, if you go out and see the astronaut encounter uh, twice a day, an astronaut is going to tell his story and then uh, go and have uh, an autograph session. And Nick is in charge of that. And we built a, a great relationship with you out there and your whole staff out there. They do a fabulous job. It's it's a, really, in a way, a thankless job. You think every day an astronaut shows up and... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk to the public is just a, a wonderful thing out there, and, and business has been good. Uh, Marty Winkle, our cameraman, co-producer, Marty and I are celebrating our third anniversary this Thursday, Stay Curious, Born Out of the Pandemic. Our first program was March 23rd, 2020, and so we're going to be talking about that throughout the week here. But the people that have been watching us is why we're continuing. Bill Whiting, good to see that you're back here on the Space Coast from Michigan. 
uh, and uh, his Michigan State team beat the Marquette Golden Eagles in basketball. Umberto Lopez is watching. Tom UCX out there. Doug Forrest is in Los Angeles. Dave Stangy's watching us up in Michigan. Uh, Marisa Krasowski out there. Why don't you sh shout out a few out there for us there? Okay, you've got Tom Tel Celentano, Christina Smith, uh, Opiel Salt. Oh, uh, yeah, Ophelia. Ophelia, okay. She's in Normandy, France. Sat Satriel. Uh huh. Uh, Carlton Bailey. Shout out to Carlton. Um, let's see, Mikey Haddad. Bennett. Mikey's going to do a show Wednesday with us. Okay. He's our payload specialist. Excellent. And then Bennett Scarborough, Steve Hammer, Hazel Banks, Howard Pepper, Michael Rose, uh, the Code Blue Collective, Captain yeah. Nicholas, uh, Dano Damano, uh, Gary Jarrell, Danielle DeJong, and Christopher Mick. And I would like to say hello to some friends that I'm going to be sending this presentation to. Uh, astronauts Wendy Lawrence, uh, Ken Cameron, Terry Wilkett, uh, as always, my wife Laura, and my uh, sister-in-law Valerie. So to all of you out there, uh, it's always good to see you, and we hope you enjoy this episode of Stay Curious. That's right. Paul Hickson was also watching there. We appreciate mm -hmm. everybody that supported the American Space Museum through our Stay Curious program here. I told Nick I wanted to throw a few pictures of our museum in there, and there is Gus's brother, Virgil, That's... Uh, with his Gus Mobile t-shirt on there, and we have in our... Just uh, behind us here is Gus's flight suit and the picture of him wearing it with his family after the GT3 mission. Yeah, that's Lowell Grissom standing there with that uh, very historic uh, flight suit of Gus's. Yeah. And where he's wearing the Gus Mobile uh, uh, shirt. Lowell, of course, has been without, out there with us for many years for the observation of the Apollo 1 uh, anniversary out at Pad 34. He wasn't with us this uh, most recent year. But uh, we want to say hello to Lowell. We'll be sending this uh podcast to him too yep. and Lowell we're thinking of you and we look forward to seeing you again soon we too we missed you in January and uh, he's a great guy he yep. champions his brother's legacy and he worked for McDonald's right in mm -hmm. the public relations for Mr. Mac, you I bet. believe yeah yep. Yep. A, a great guy and like I said he he's he's championed his brother's memory in there and we will never forget our astronauts and there though he passed away before we harvested handprints for our famous space view park we've got a beautiful relief of gus grissom at the gemini and apollo uh, uh, uh and and mercury three mm -hmm. places out there and the uh headrest of uh, also in our museum is john young's headrest that he used in a trainer and uh, uh and this is uh i meant to point that out but we're so many things to point out here with Nick Thomas comes on board, but that's a cool artifact of our museum there. And there is uh, Mr. Young, mm -hmm. where his handprints were dedicated out there at Space View Park. Those mm -hmm. names are workers that gave us a hundred bucks to be immortalized. Marty's out there. Uh, John Young was very involved with our museum. And I'm amused when people visit us from Orlando and don't know John Young Parkway <laughs> is named after this great astronaut. Well, John told me at one point, he said, you don't know how many letters I get from people, particularly one little old lady who sent him a letter and said, you need to take better care of your parkway. It's a mess. <laughs> Lady, right? I don't have anything to do with it. You know, <laughs> really? They just named it after me. That's all I know. Probably. Born in San Francisco, but grew up in the Orlando, Orlando area. area. And, and John Young, the JYPs, where they announced it in the morning traffic patterns. Nick Thomas, of course, you know that, that we honor our space workers and the whole space history like we feel like none other. And that's because people like you are willing to share your great stories there. Another great episode here of Stay Curious with Mr. Nick Thomas. In fact, this is episode 776 today. Okay. So and, the uh, lucky one is next. And next one is where you're going to buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, right? we're going to buy three sevens will be tomorrow. <laughs> and we've got a special guest that walked in the door this morning, an Apollo Brit that worked with Bendix mm -hmm. named Keith Wright. You're going to hear some great stories from uh, the uh, the British side of the pond dealing with our and what they did to put us on the moon. They were very involved with the Apollo Lunar Experiment uh, uh, Science Package, LSEP, on there. So Keith Wright, thank you for showing up, and you're going to enjoy a little program with him. And he brought me some really cool pictures that 
uh, I've never seen before, too, of the Alcet Pendler construction with astronauts looking at it and stuff like that. And Wednesday, Mikey Haddad, who's watching today, he's written a book. He's a payloads level four engineer for NASA. And we're going to talk about the two astronomy missions, Astro 1 and 2. Astro 2 is one of our shuttles of the month of March. So. And a good friend of ours from those flights, Sam Durantz, lives locally. That's right. He's Mr. worked Sam with us Durantz. quite often. And uh, Sam tells some great stories. And the highlight of uh, of a briefing by Sam Durantz is when he puts up the slide of the Astro Observatory in the Payload Bay, and he talks about the first time he saw the Earth from up on orbit. And the way he talks about it, I swear you think that it happened to him 30 minutes ago. He, he has never lost the wow. awe and the and the, the the great feeling of seeing the Earth for the first time. It's still with him, and it's with him as heavily as it was that first moment he looked out the window. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's it's amazing how many times some of these astronauts tell their story, mm -hmm. and. And some of them just like it's fresh first yeah, time. Yeah. It, it, it never leaves. You'll hear again. you'll hear his throat catch. I mean, it means yeah. that much to him. Well, I can't wait to get out of Space Center and see some more astronauts uh, that uh, Nick Thomas is going to wrangle out there to show your appreciation to what you've uh -huh. done for us there. <laughs> I brought you a little cigar here, you? my friend there. Who told you? Well, I went over to old Harry Smooth's there, okay. and I, I know that you're probably not a stranger there. Uh -huh. And so I want you to enjoy a fine Thank cigar very much. to celebrate our third birthday. And Appreciate I got one that. for myself here. Good so. show. All right. This Nick little... Thomas, thank you very much for thank you very all much you do at our museum it. here. We appreciate your thank stories. You. And we'll have Nick back again here and pick up uh, some wonderful legacy of the space program that he wants to talk about. We're also working on some programs to maybe look at a decade at a time, the, the major accomplishments there. So, Nick, great to have you here uh, as, as a part of our wrangling uh, of space workers here. And once again, we've got a great show tomorrow about the ALSEP program with a European Brit and payloads. Of, of astronomy telescopes with Mikey Haddad on Wednesday. Thursday, we're going to celebrate our third anniversary of bringing you Stay Curious. And Friday, who knows what will happen. Uh, we'll, we'll fix it. We'll come to it then when we get there. In the meantime, thank you, Marty, for a great Streamlabs production today. Anything we need to, sh to share or button up? Nope, we're good to go. Very good. And until tomorrow, when we talk about the Apollo Lunar Science uh, experiments and how the British were involved in that with Bendix. Until tomorrow, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you and Nick Thomas again to bridge the space between us.